Hi, and welcome everyone. Welcome to Conversations About Transformation. I'm here with Kelly Notaris and Carl Buquet, and um, really excited for this conversation. So here's what the, the conversation series is about. We have paired our master trainers with some of our graduates who are doing some extraordinary things with the training in their lives and in their work. And so we're gonna dive into how they have incorporated transformational NLP into their lives and into their work and also their unique perspectives on transformation and lasting change. This is especially timely at this time of year, which if you're listening to this, it's we're recording at the beginning of 2022 when all of our attention is on what we wanna change and we hope that it will last this time. Um, <laughs> So if you're new to NLP Marin, we really welcome you. NLP Marin is the only place in the world to learn transformational NLP, which is a unique modality of healing and change. So through our curriculum, our students develop their confidence and their competence. They do their own highly personal change work <clears throat> and they learn cutting edge skills that they bring back into their fields for really truly masterful excellence. Um, so welcome to today's conversation, which we're titling Shifting the Resistance that Thwarts Creative Projects. I like that word. It feels very uh, sinister. And, uh, yes, you've, <laughs> you, you've used the word thwart in a sentence, Liana. This is excellent. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, my, my personality that's stuck in the 1920s okay. has okay. been indicated. Yes, no, yes. yes. <laughs> um, my son likes to listen to detective stories, and so he'd be he'd be really happy that Fort made it in. Um, so I mean, this, obviously this is a conversation with, with Kelly Nataris and um, who is author and speaker and book editor and entrepreneur. We'll learn more about her work in a moment. And then Carl Buchheit, co-founder of NLP Marin and both of our mentors. Real quick, I'm Liana Silver. I'm also a graduate of NLP Marin and I'm just gonna be emceeing here in the background, stay out of these two um, wonderful folks this way. So I got my certification as a master transformational NLP practitioner in something like 2010. I'm not real sure. So it's been a minute. Um, and I definitely have applied so many facets of that training to my work with clients in my private practice um, as a transformational coach for women, certainly in my life, certainly in my parenting, and also in my first book, Feminine Genius, which I believe Kelly had a little bit of input on, um, so we have that connection as well. Um, I also work at NLP Marin, applying the concepts of transformational NLP to the marketing and messaging of the school and to some of the graduates of the school. So I'm delighted to introduce formally Kelly. Um, Kelly started her, so Kelly, I'm gonna just do the formal thing and then you add anything that, that I might have missed. You got it. So Kelly started her book editing career right out of college by moving to New York, where she worked in the editorial divisions at Avon Books, HarperCollins, Penguin USA, and Hyperion Books. If you know anything about the book world, those are the biggies. Then she wrote, relocated to Boulder, Colorado, where she became the VP associate publisher at Spirituality Publisher Sounds True. There, she received her education in transformational nonfiction, editing books by Sharon Salzberg, Adya Shanti, Krishna, Krishna Das, David Data, and many more. She went freelance in 2010, and since then has edited a wide variety of books, including Intimate Conversations with the Divine by Carolyn Mace, and New York Times bestsellers, The Tapping Solution by Nick Ortner, and Pussy, A Reclamation by Regina thomas Shower. Kelly speaks regularly at the Hay House Writers Workshops and co-produces the membership-based Hay House Writers Community along with Hay House CEO, Reed Tracy. But her proudest accomplishment is her book, Studio, KN Literary Arts, whose mission is to amplify positive change in the world through the medium of books. Kelly, happy to have you. Did we miss anything? No, that was very thorough. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Just, I I, it's nice to hear it all. I'm like, oh, right. That's right. I did yeah. that. That's right. That's good. I, I wanted to cut stuff, but I couldn't. So there we go. Yeah. I was doing pretty well here until I heard all of that. So now <laughs> Yeah, now Carl's intimidated. Yeah, I'm just, yes. <laughs> well, Carl, uh, you actually add in anything if you want. It can be true. It can be false. We'll never know. <laughs> um, 
Carl, you never know. <laughs> that would be true. Uh, so Carl Bukite, PhD, who is uh, NLP Marin co-founder, training director, and author of Transformational NLP uh, for over 40 years. Carl has practiced, taught, and extended the technology known as Transformational NLP. Carl trains from the heart, backed with a brilliant intellect, insatiable curiosity, and unconventional humor. The result is a fun-filled learning experience where all the aspects of students and their lives are welcomed and included. His, he challenges his students to explore themselves, the world, and life in a way that respects and uplifts everyone. Carl has been involved in NLP, in NLP since the mid-1970s. He is certainly one of the finest practitioners of NLP in the world and quite possibly the busiest. His ongoing intense private practice with clients keeps what he presents fresh and alive. Carl, anything you want to add? We'll never know. <laughs> um, no, I think that about covers it pretty well. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I feel yeah. graced to be in such company. Um, so let's talk about resistance and creative projects and what you all have to say on those topics. Let's start with Kelly and just give us a sense of what's your life and work like these days as you've incorporated transformational NLP? Yes. Well, so I graduated in 2015. And so it's been about seven years as of this recording since that time. And I mean, my company has totally exploded since that time. And I would say that there are components of it that are probably, you know, market based. And there are components of it that are based on my own um, growth, change, transformation that I was able to make in that time. And um, so we are, yeah, we're a book studio. We help people write, edit, self-publish and market their books. Um, we, I have uh, about 12 people on the core team and then we have dozens and dozens of writers, editors and coaches that are, we're lucky enough that they want to work with us and with our clients. So, um, so yeah, so we are, we are a growing operation and I definitely had many turning points during the time that I was um, actually in class with Carl, but also many since that time. And I meet with Carl semi-regularly uh, for private work because I need to touch up every now and again to re remind myself that um, change is possible. And yeah, so I can't, I can't even really begin to say all the different ways in which um, NLP touches my relationship with my clients really and with the team you know um, we are one of many companies out there that will help you get your book into the world we're the only one I know that is so uh, what I call high touch with our clients um, we are always in relationship with our clients and that is for sure baked into the core of the company because of the time I spent um, growing the company and also doing NLP Marin at the same time there's no way to be creative and to actually take a project like a book all the way to the finish line without doing your work. <laughs> it's a must do. There's um, so much that I could talk about around how we work with our clients that is informed by my time with Carl and um, NLP Marin. Beautiful. Well, well, we'll get into some of those. Carl, are you gonna say something? Did I cut you off? I just said, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very true. Yeah. It's amazing to me to continue to hear and we'll continue to hear the ways that the concepts, the perspectives, definitely the tools have made it into incredibly different arenas um, and are making such a deep impact, um, which, which, which you're alluding to. So definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think so much about Carl, how you always say that if someone comes into the NLP Marin classroom and the thing they want to do is clean off their desk, you know, <laughs> it's a very long journey. <laughs> a long, it's going to be a long journey with many dark times, but they get through it, yes. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. I mean, it's the kind of thing where you think it's so simple. I have clients come to us all the time and they say, I've been wanting to write a book for 20 years. I know exactly what the book is about. It's about my life's work. I have, I could, you know, talk to you about it all day long, but when I sit down to try to write it, I just can't do it. And usually it's, we do something we call breakthrough resistance coaching, which is essentially NLP coaching um, to get them through and to have them see the places where they're blocked because it, it can look so innocent. Oh, there's just, I just don't prioritize it, but really underneath it, there's so much. 
I just don't have a clean desk or I don't <laughs> prioritize it. Yeah, yeah. Well, taking that a bit further. So, you know, you're helping people, right? Ooh, we didn't put that. Is your book out, Kelly? We didn't put that in here. Is my no. book out? Okay. I don't know. Perhaps it is out. <laughs> Perhaps it is. So as you help people write the books they are born to write, which is the title yeah. of Kelly's, uh, Kelly's recent book. Um, Carol, we might have right. you fish years out too. Yes, exactly. Um, what, what is most useful? So when you're doing that coaching, what, what has them yeah. make, what makes yeah. a difference between it being a really good idea and something that's in their heart to being in the world? Right. Absolutely. Well, the entirety of chapter six in my book is, um, pulled semi directly from Carl Buchheit. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, really it's about resistance. It's about managing your resistance or, or learning to look at your resistance because so often people come to me and they have the best of intentions and the best ideas. And they know that this is something that they want to do at a soul level. They need to get this book out and somehow life continues to get in the way. So first things I do is I just figure out, okay, really let's talk about timing. Like what's going on in your life right now? Is it actually, do you have the time? And you, I would say in 90% of cases, they actually have the time. Um, and so then we have to look at, okay, so what is it that's actually standing in the way? And, you know, we go through all the things that we talk about in NLP Marin and really going back to mom and dad, you know, as much as people don't want to do that, don't want to revisit the childhood, you know, questions, the family of origin, that's usually at the heart of all of it. You know, maybe mom really wanted to be a novelist and it just never happened for her. So it, that it becomes a family loyalty blockage in their system. Or um, maybe it's that being seen is not safe in their, you know, whole family constellation. And so they realize they are going to put this book in the world and somehow, and people are going to know more about them than they've known before. And that is actually, they don't realize it consciously until we work through it, but it turns out that seems like it's unsurvivable. So we just bring to the surface <laughs> those hidden blocks and then do the kinds of uh, change work that we learn in NLP Marin that is very simple, Comp just something you can do over Zoom with someone, but actually moves mountains on the inside and gets them to the point where they can truly sit down and do write the book that they were born to write. Carl, will you weigh in on what most of us need to know about resistance, but we never learn, <laughs> but, but we usually do at your hands? Um. Well, the resistance that everyone experiences, well, some of us experience resistance about everything all the time. And all of us experience resistance about some things some of the time. Resistance is an expression of, um, it's to say it in a little bit kind of jargony way, it's an expression of safety patterning, safety wiring because the word programming is built into the title. Neuro-linguistic programming, we can say safety programming. It's safety wiring. And the thing is that it's, it's out of date. Um, there's a question that we ask just really simply, what's the difference between whatever the sensations are that someone is experiencing or the feelings that, that they experience or the thing that happens in, in their body when they're cruising along and they have goals and intentions and they're in some process and, and then something happens and it stops feeling good and it starts feeling bad. Right there in that spot, everyone's temptation is to regard that as some kind of shortcoming or, or failure. Whereas for us, it's their systems, and we'll just narrow that down just for convenience to their brain for a second. It's the brain's very best attempt to keep them well and safe. Difficulty is that the self that's being kept well and safe by introducing those feelings like being seen or progressing past where a parent did in some important endeavor in life. The, the, the riddle we use, what's the difference between that kind of sensation and cottage cheese? And the answer is the cottage cheese comes with an expiration date. So what we wanna do is just notice how that is being created, not so much why, although that's important, but why we can, can discover pretty quickly, but how it's being done in terms of like quite really directly, how is their brain producing that sensation? And then we 
we revise it so that sensation doesn't occur so that something more useful occurs right in that moment and their momentum continues or their enthusiasm continues, their, mo their motivation keeps going on. Um, we have the experience that our patterning delivers for us. I mean, it sounds sort of unfortunate, but mostly our patterning delivers life and a world to have a life in. So it's pretty cool. Every once in a while, it just gets stirred up and says, no, 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 not safe, not safe, not safe. And it's designed to stop us. Stopping is not an indication of some shortcoming again or failure. It's really effective safety wiring, probably taking care of someone who's five or six years old. And except for the five or six year olds who are published. So, you know. <laughs> Kelly, would you, would you add anything about that? Well, like, just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just love the, the reminder that and this is so important, I think, also, again, with creatives who are blocked, there's so much shame. I should be able to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm an artist. I want to be an artist. This is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. My soul's calling me in this direction, and then they can't do it, and they feel like there's something wrong with them. But the reminder that, no, it's actually what your brain is designed to do. It's designed to keep you safe and keep you from falling into whatever crater you fell into at some point a really long time ago and, you know, almost didn't survive. So it's actually not something to be ashamed of. It's something to be, as you always say, to have reverence for Carl. And it's really, you've got to have reverence for that. It, it was really important at um, the time that it was installed. And our brains aren't all that great at keeping track of who we are and where we are now. They're, um, they're, um, what's one of the things transform, transformational NLP is really, really good for is allowing our brains, our safety patterning of Riva to catch up with our minds and our hearts. Yeah, to catch up with our identities. And when that can be arranged, then the identity of the mind and heart in present time that has attention on future wonderfulness, usually, yeah then we can proceed forward. The objective is to have the experience we want to have to be able to move in the way we want to move without having to remember to fight against something or without having even really to remember to try to be different about something. We just want what we want to unfold. And that seems like a tall order, but when things are arranged correctly, when things are up to date, it's just what happens. It's just how nature works. Mm -hmm. Carl, you said something that is a, a maybe the number one thing about NLP, uh, neuro linguistic programming, which is that it pays attention to not why something has happened, but how it happens. Now, that might take a couple hours to really explain, but could you share a little bit about what you mean by how, um, especially for people who for whom this is really new? Okay, um, I'll take my elevator talk, which is usually about 12 minutes. I perfected it in the world's tallest skyscraper. Um, <laughs> see if I can shorten that down a little bit. Um, human experience, well, if everyone just takes a moment and notice your experience right now, whatever that is, as you're watching and, and, and listening. Um, this is experience and experience is experience. And it's sort of like we say, what, what goes into your experience? And we might be able to talk about what we see or what we feel, or in this case also what we're listening to. On the inside, the way our, our, our brains and nervous systems work is they assemble our human experience out of five ingredients. And they're not surprising ingredients. They're just really kind of remarkably important. Pictures and sounds and feelings and smells and tastes. The five senses, obviously. And when there are sixth and seventh senses, which there certainly are, those always kind of come back to one of the five. So someone who is clairvoyant, uses visual sense that's not located with to local like photons and so forth, but it's a visual sensation. So our brains weave our worlds out of these, out of these sensations and they do it at light speed. And um, neuro-linguistic programming is the only discipline in the world. And I've checked, I've tried to find someplace else that does it 
and I haven't found any place. It's the only discipline in the world that can slow experience down enough and kind of rewind it and cause it to un unfold frame by frame by frame, just to make a, like a movie analogy, frame by frame by frame by frame until we come to the moment in the person's experience where where they become afraid or they become shy or they become envious or whatever it is, whatever the unwanted state fires up. And we can find out exactly how that's done. And the way we do that is by paying attention to information, flows of signals and indication that come from person's body, from their voice, from their breathing, from actually how their eyeballs are moving around. We teach all of this in a few hours and it takes a while to actually learn it and, and get good at it. Well, the introduction to it takes a few minutes and is really fun. If anyone ever wants to attend one of our introductions to transformational NLP, so which we do here on Zoom. So what we can do is if someone says, you know, I, I was going along just fine and then I just couldn't get myself to go forward. I just couldn't do it. What we can do is ask a very casual question in plain English. Ah, so you couldn't keep going, yeah, yeah. What stops you? Now, this is a question that's got content in it. And the person will say, well, in the, in the middle 90s, my therapist told me, and that's just fine. I mean, that's information about their experience, but it doesn't tell us how the patterning, how the programming is working. When we say what stops you, their body will indicate where in time and space there is some information available inside, in the time, the timeless time and the infinite space that goes on inside human consciousness. We can pinpoint the events that happened and they usually have to do with a younger self who was afraid, who was cast out, who was, concern that they would never belong again, who was ashamed, all of these negative things which we are not designed to tolerate. Humans are not designed to tolerate really strong negatives. We're designed because we are creatures um, as well as other kinds of beings. We're designed to stop in the presence of that kind of threat and then either hold still or go somewhere else. And uh, so if someone is having trouble continuing with their writing, I, while I'm working with them, I can just say, golly, that sounds awful. You really, this is important to you. Yeah, it's really what stops you. And in the next split second, their body will show me how to go find the, the deeply recorded experiences that are getting in the way that their brain is paying attention to because it's been instructed, make sure this never happens again. And it does a good job of making sure that never happens again, only it shuts us down. It distracts us, it sends us somewhere else. It's really direct and for the most part, it's really fun except in excruciating moments, but they're very short because we don't ask anyone to have to relive anything to process their trauma or something like that. We just go in and rewire it, rearrange it. If if human beings had backspace keys as the work as nicely as computer keyboards do, we would go find where the typo is, so to speak, we'd backspace it out. We would replace it and see what came out. That's essentially what we do. Not quite that simply, but not that far away either sometimes. Resistance is good. It means to throw oneself against something, to take a, it, take, it, it, it means to take a stand against something. So we take our systems take a stand against that which is still coded to be threatening, invalidating, and so on and so on and so on. And that's adjustable. And if in fact someone is going to be kidnapped by aliens, if their book is published and sells too well, then we kind of turn that over to another department. <laughs> That was, the building got shorter for the elevator. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. I think that we, we do eight months of work before we get to yeah. start to work with that question. So thank you. Kelly, anything you want to add or how you work with that 
question and what it gives us access to with your clients or in your life? Yeah. I mean, the question, what stops you is, is a question that is, um, has become just pivotal in my life. I would say more in my personal life than even in the business, you know, it's, it's the kind of question that you can ask yourself whenever something is happening, that's not what you would like, you know, whenever something is going wrong or sideways, or you're not getting the thing that you want, what I love about NLP Marin is that it gives what I would consider to be a countercultural message that is things are not always happening to you. They are happening for you and through your own um, you know, lens and your brain's own filters. So it gives a certain sense of power, not to say that anything, you know, that there aren't larger forces at work. There are many larger forces at work, systemic forces at work in all of our lives, but there is a way that we can co-create or be a part of our own life. And the, the change work techniques that I learned in NLP Marin have made it so, you know, I know if there's something that's happening in my life that is um, not going the way I want it to, I actually have resources. So there, it's, it's not just falling into sort of a, um, depression about it or a sadness or a feeling like there's a hopelessness. Um, same to go to when I'm talking about my clients who feel hopeless, they're not getting their book done. I always feel hope. I know that there are many different techniques that I have that I can either bring to the client or I can actually use with myself to get to that deeper place, whatever it is in myself that is more safe, not having the thing that I want than having it. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that it starts off with just you. It starts off with just your own little life, but it actually can bleed out into a bigger world where we're sitting in a world where there are many major issues that need to be handled that we actually have to get in there and work with. And I find that I have a different type of hope for the world, for the divisions around us, for the choices that the our ancestors have made that have brought us to this place today, I feel like there is hope for change. And, and we have some of the, those tools from the NLP Marin world actually will be able to be used in the bigger way. That's my, my hope and my belief. Wow. That's beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I've constantly been um, having that repeated and reaffirmed throughout these conversations that the perspectives that um, we aren't, even if we take our understanding of resistance, that we aren't, there isn't something wrong that we have resistance. We're actually, as you said, Carl, throwing ourselves up against un being unsafe. And, and re so the way that this <clears throat> translates to how we relate to ourself and then to the seemingly intractable issues in the world is, is, is powerful. There's also one more thing I'll say upon yes. that front. It's just that one, one thing that we talk about a lot in NLP Marin is the system, the bigger system, the family system, but the larger system and how their, our own personal work has impact in that system. The work that we do can clear things for our ancestors, for other people, you know, in the world. And that systemic piece, I think is going to be one of the most important understandings that we need, must have as a culture to move forward. We have to know we are not individual people just part being ourselves. We are actually all part of something bigger and we can make a positive change by doing our own inner work on the world around us. You're, you're on mute, Liana. Oh, good. The only thing I said was so, so we're good. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so taking that a step further and talking a little bit more about actualizing creative pro projects, about changing things about ourselves or out in the world, we approach things like I'm broken, I'll fix myself, or I need more willpower. So what's your sense? And this is a question for both of you. What works better than willpower? And we will, you know, we certainly started in this conversation to speak about it and perhaps there's more to share about it. Yeah. Willpower is not that I'll go, great. I'll, yeah. I'll go first on willpower. <laughs> yeah, I was going to hand the baton to you anyway. <laughs> um, it, it, it is my experience that there is no such thing as willpower. What willpower is, is an expression of having the right kinds of sensations, essentially the right kinds of feelings in the right place, in the right context, in the right time. 
So um, the example I use often is that the person who gets up at five o'clock in the morning to go running every morning, as opposed to all the rest of us who set the alarm for 5.30 because who wants to be crazy and get up at five, but then roll back over and snuggle back down. We don't, we would like to go running, let's say at 5.30 in the morning, but we don't. The person who actually does it, and at five o'clock even, they do that because that is absolutely the best, absolutely the best feeling option in their world. It may be little tiny increments initially, but then in larger and larger and larger kind of expansive feelings. It's the best feeling option on their menu. Person who goes running at five o'clock in the morning does that because it's the, to do anything else doesn't feel as good. Now, how that got arranged, what supports that, uh, there's all, there are all kinds of variables th that go into that. So they can have a buddy they go running with and they don't want to let their buddy down and the buddy reciprocates and that's really helpful. But the thing is having the buddy to go running with changes the priority of how we feel about something. There are lots, so that's an external intervention to have a, a running buddy. An internal intervention would be to change the, to put the person's brain in the presence of the feeling state that lets the human get up and wanna go running. This is all there is to it. The people who do remarkable things, they have patterning, they learned it, they were born with it, they were blessed with it, they struggled to it, however they got it. They have patterning that makes what they want to do the best feeling option in their world. And they go do it because to do anything else doesn't feel as good. It's about the feeling. The feelings come from pictures and they come from sounds and they come from all of those senses. But the gist of it is the, the art of motivation and willpower is to arrange for what you want to feel better than what you don't want. And that takes a bit of reprogramming sometimes, repatterning. And it's really fun and it's really cool. And sometimes it's really mysterious. And um, so the, the most brave and courageous people in, in the world, the people who take care of other people in the face of great adversity, we admire the heck out of that. We also, kind of want to be curious, gee, if we needed to operate that way, and maybe we'll say, thank goodness we don't, but if we did need to operate that way, how would we have to arrange what we are experiencing internally and collectively, like with the team, with the group, so that we could have the same, the same patterning, so we could operate in a really similar way. Willpower is learnable and teachable, and it, it's how to have the right feeling in the right time in the right place. That's what it's about. Makes all the difference in the world though. And can I say one more thing about this willpower and feeling stuff? We are programmed as humans, as creatures, we're programmed to always, there are no exceptions to what I'm about to say. That sounds crazy, but there are no exceptions to this. We're, we are programmed to always move toward the best feeling option that is on our menu of reality. Nobody can move forward past a certain kind of negative unless that negative turns into something positive or unless it turns into something even more negative. Like, oh my God, if I don't do this, I'm going to be in real trouble. We'll move forward. If we come up to a negative and we stop and then the coach says, come on, you can do it, like ex external intervention. And then, uh, and then we can start moving again. But we were designed to not go past certain negatives unless something else is available. We just call that a frozen negative state. It just doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't lead to anything worse, which could get us going again. It doesn't lead to anything better, which would get us going again. No one ever, ever selects the third best thing in their life. And now we're all famous for making kind of really awful choices sometimes about some things. But no one ever sets out to, to say, what is absolute, who is absolutely the worst person I could possibly have a relationship with, right? 
they may say to themselves, I don't know about this. This might not be such a fabulous idea, but the feeling that goes with it is the best feeling that's on the menu in the moment. So they move toward it. Um, that we always and only go toward the best feeling that's available to us doesn't mean what we're making like good choices. It just means that the menu we're selecting from is offering us the best thing. And maybe we could use some different choices as well, like a, a, a more rich menu of possibilities. So we don't have to ever fight with ourselves to do the right thing. We just have to arrange for the right thing to feel the right way and be available on the menu. So here's the heresy part. We can't learn to make better choices. What we can do is to is a, is arrange to put a lot better things on our menu of possibility of real possibilities related to reality, and then our system will select the best thing automatically. And I know that takes most of the fun out of personal growth because we're supposed to make better choices. And I don't think we are. I think we're supposed to have better menus. Mm, beautiful. I want to just underscore this for a second, and maybe Kelly, you can offer your words with it. It's, it's not. It, it's kind of heretical, but it is so countercultural, as you said, Kelly. So I just want to underscore this idea that we're always choosing the best option on our menu. We're not self-sabotaging, we're not lazy, we're not broken in some way, but as we look into the how of how we do this, this is about that really we can trust as humans, we're always sorting for what feels best. And I think that is radical. Mm -hmm. Would you have anything, Kelly? Yeah. yeah. I totally agree. And I feel like it's you know, right now there's the, all these sort of life hacking sort of modalities that are out there and all this idea that you can optimize everything and it's almost all external. You know, you optimize by drinking this kind of coffee in the morning and getting into an ice bath and like any number of, you know, insane things. Um, I'm, if you all like ice baths, I'm uh, no offense. Um, but, uh, but iced, I actually- Iced coffee bath. Ice coffee bath, exactly. Ice, ice bulletproof coffee bath. Um, but, but what I love about NLP Marin is that it really does say, you know, what we've learned there is just says like, it isn't about you forcing yourself to do something that you think is good for you. It's really like looking at your brain as a, a car, <laughs> you know, like the engine and you can just lift the hood. And if you know what to look for and how to turn this wheel this way, or this, you know, dial this way, you actually can make that change. Like you said, the backspace key, which as a writer, I love um, the backspace key, you know, going back and, and deleting that one little line or making that one little change that actually makes a big change. And it doesn't have to be hard. That's the other piece that I learned from NLP Marin. It does not have to be hard. Sometimes the hardest part is finding your way to, okay, which of these dials do I need to turn? And that's where we need, you know, Carl's help sometimes, but, uh, but we, th there's a dial, there's a dial to be turned and maybe you have to do some work to get stuff out of the way so you can access that particular dial. But I, I, again, that hope comes up for me, hope that whatever we want, we can actually have, we just need to, you know, know how to access it, which is what Carl offers us. I want to ask, I've got three questions left. I want to ask this to Kelly first, and then Carl, maybe you can add in. It's a little bit mm, the cousin of, of our topic. Kelly, you were, were sharing previously that so that, that transformational NLP and the tools have really uh, shifted how you work with clients or even friends or family members where defensiveness might, might have come up, which is, I don't know, we could call that a form of resistance, I suppose. And I'm just curious if you can speak to what you've got on your menu now to have that go differently. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I will just pick up family because I feel like that's one that we all have. Um, we've all got got something something going on there. Um, for me, what I learned, you know, was that was to how to see through um, a lens of compassion, honestly, and again, reverence for the present state of whoever it is that I'm looking at. So there are ways in which 
you know, I have an amazing mom who also I'm the daughter of a mom and there that that's a fraught thing to, to be in <laughs> a mom daughter relationship. And there've been moments where it's been hard, you know, um, I think for both of us. And I actually feel like I was able to lay down all of my, um, all of my defenses when I made my way through NLP Marin. And interestingly, I had this very interesting series of dreams when I was in going through NLP Marin, they were all about my family and my mother and seeing my mother in lights that I had not seen before. And I really believe that if we can do that, if we can start to see that everyone is an adult on one level, but also holding all of the younger, the imprints of the younger ages as well, we can find a certain sense of compassion, the way you would feel about a child who messed up, you can start feeling about your parent who messed up. And, you know, even though there were things that were not necessarily okay for a lot of people, we can see why and how, how more importantly than why they became who they, they are today. And for me, I mean, I've just can't even tell you how much my relationships with my family have changed and um, just so much more easy to access the love now and to have a good time at holidays and, you know, vacations and things like that. If you want to just get to the day to day of it, you know, enjoying each other's company versus, you know, girding for a fight. So I, I can't, I can't be more grateful for that piece for me. Carl, I know that was Kelly's personal story of actually being able to enjoy family gatherings. <clears throat> Anything you want to add on just a different way of seeing people or what shifts a defensive outlook? Well, we all learn our safety patterning in our, in our patterning to make sure we belong, which is essentially almost the same thing as being safe. Um, we all learn it in relation to other humans. And we can only really revise it in relation to other humans and with other humans. So learning to do this kind of change work, although it's really straightforward and really fun, and bits of it can be done in isolation, uh, or they can be, they, we can learn bits of it all by ourselves. We can read a book a bit and try some stuff out, but it's all done with, with others of like kind, with other human beings. So, uh, it's important that people have other people to participate with as they're learning to revise and kind of update and more appropriately respect who they are and where they've been and who they are becoming. Um, we need other humans to do that. And it really helps to learn to do that, to practice doing that with them or for them, or shall I say about them. Um, it's often quite delightful to learn to respect someone else's experience, especially the painful parts. It's often really rewarding to learn to respect that experience more than they can, because they can't do that right now in their life. They're ashamed, they're afraid, they're collapsed about something, they're contracted. They can't do that. So when we learn to do that with them, and maybe to a certain extent for them for a little while, we're learning this really remarkable really beautiful human capacity, which is uh, to respect what we're all up to here and keep making choices for what seems to be uh, better and better and better individually and collectively. Kelly says it really nicely. It's not just an individual thing. We all have individual brains and we're all unique, but the way I try to describe it is we're all unique in pretty much exactly the same ways. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Two last questions. Uh, Kelly, is there anything you want to say to Carl, to Carla, any of the other trainers, NLP Marin in general? Yeah, well, I mean, I could, Carl, what do I want to say to you? Um, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, I feel like I've said many, many things. I, I um, yeah, over the years, just so much gratitude and so many belly laughs and so many really important tears and so much learning and so much growing into an adult happened because of NLP Marin. And, you know, so, so grateful for having had it cross my path and for having, you know, just heard the whisper of the call. Like I wasn't, I wasn't one of those people who was like, 
get me in that classroom. I'm going, you know, I didn't really want to take the class. And I had a friend, Robbie, who said, um, Hey, just come for one. Just, I'm going to be doing it. Just come sit in on the first weekend, just see whatever you can drop out if you want to. And I was like, fine, you know, and I went <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I was in the front row for the next, you know, year, <laughs> um, because so much, was be I it was so clear to me that there was going to be change available. And at the time I really needed it. You know, I had come to I've done a lot of personal growth work. I have done a lot of personal growth work. I mean, you tell me a personal growth workshop, I've probably done it. And honestly, when people ask me what's the best thing you've ever done, without any question and really with no competition, it's NLP Marin. If someone wants real change, this is where I send them. I would have you drop the mic, but I have one more question. Uh, and so this is for both of you. Um, if you left our audience uh, with knowing one thing about transformation or change, what would it be? I mean, I guess the thing that just pops into my head is that it is possible. It truly is. I mean, I go back to my theme for today is hope. You know, there's reason to hope. There's reason to hope for just about any issue that you're seeing. And there's, and for every issue, there's reason to hope for a deeper understanding of it, whether you can turn it around or not. You know, I think it depends on certain things, but you'll know why you're experiencing what you're experiencing and how it got coded in and how we can, how to go in there and turn some dials. So change is possible. Carl, you can have a full 12 minutes, but I'd love to <laughs> no, what you might say. I, I think I'm just going up to the cafeteria this time. <laughs> um, um, as humans, we're, I think we're sort of famous all over the galaxy for, ex humans are famous for experiencing a lot of what they don't want to experience and for not experiencing a lot of what they do want to experience. And I'm not so certain that you can do that every place in the universe, but planet Earth seems to be very, very, very exquisitely designed to make that available. About transformation, the experience we are having, however difficult it is, and it's often extraordinarily difficult for, for humans. I mean, there's no question, we're not pretending that's not so. And sometimes it's just dull or annoying, and sometimes it's, it's well, all those, those are the things I could stick on if I were going to the top of the skyscraper right now. What I would like to say about that experience is that it is extraordinarily precious. Um, we don't have anything but our experience. If we imagine like, what would we be experiencing if we took away all of our experience, then someone might go out to a place of, well, I would be experiencing some sort of cosmic oneness. And then we would say, wait a minute, you're, that's what you would be, but that's what you would be experiencing is cosmic oneness. But if you weren't without your experience, what would, the, and the answer is experience is all we have. We are, I think we are here in this world to have our experience and when we can and how we choose to, to make that experience better for self and and other selves, so to speak. So transformation is not only possible, it's ultimately inevitable. And the th key thing of it is, as they, it's written out in ancient Sanskrit, you gotta wanna, that's all. And if you don't wanna right now, you eventually will, so. Beautiful. Well, I have to uh, be the keeper of Newtonian time and bring us to a close. I just really appreciate being here on this conversation with both of you and getting to talk about really juicy stuff, especially resistance, especially when it comes to things that we want and our creativity um, and real change. So thank you both. Thank you, Leona. Thank you, Kelly. This is really a delight. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Always a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yay, bye.